Uh, we're going to start uh, this lecture and the next lecture are going to be quite a lot of uh, particle theory. So for those of you here with um, from astrophysics, um, you might not have seen all of the background, but the idea is to kind of just demystify some of the concepts. So, um, I mean, it's, it's going to be mostly classical field theory. I will try and compute a loop today, um, but I haven't done that for more than nine years, so we might run into some problems. Um, but mostly you're just going to have to follow classical field transformations and Lagrangians and stuff. And so today, QCD axions, tomorrow, axions and string theory, and then we'll go on to more like traditionally astrophysics and cosmology things. Okay, so the QCD axion. Damn, my slide adventure doesn't work. <sighs> Nothing works. Okay, right, okay, so I've got some um, selected reading. Uh, the stuff I won't tell you about the uh, dynamic instance on gas are in Coleman um, and QFT uh, background, Shredniki, and Z. Z is very good for intuitive feelings about QFT. If you have no QFT background at all, um, I recommend just kind of reading Z when you're on the train or something like that. It's a very readable book, um, but not like technical. Okay, so um, the QCD theta term, this is where we're going to start. This is the term in the uh, Lagrangian for QCD. Um, there is classically a total derivative and doesn't affect the equations of motion as long as theta is a constant. So I'll explain what these terms are. So G nu is the gluon field strength tensor. It has an index A because there are eight gluons um, corresponding to the eight dimensions of SG3. The color group, so that so it's um, unitary three by three matrices, um, complex um, but unitary, so that takes you down to a squared um, degrees of freedom in that matrix, minus one because it's special unitary. So there are eight of these field change tensors, and these F, A, B, C are the structure constants of SU3. And this tells you that the blue one has uh, self interactions because of this, this quadratic term here. Okay, so this is, the, uh, this is what I just said. The SU3 index runs over the eight gluons, the generators of the um, algebraic representation of SU3, and these FABC are the structure constants of the algebra. This is where the bar gets annoying. Um, uh, so the indices, so this um, thing here, G mu nu with a twiddle on it, um, has had its indices raised using. The anthropogly anti-symmetric tensor epsilon. And that means that when, when we put this term into the usual um, action Lagrangian density, it does not depend on the metric at all. So the raising has a 1 over square root minus g, which cancels the square root minus g in the action b4x square root minus g. This term doesn't depend on the metric at all, it only depends on the topology of the space time. Because you're always allowed to use epsilon to raise indices. You don't have to use the metric. Okay. So, CP violation. Um, we need to talk about CP violation and how this term can be used to them. So, C is charge conjugation, P is parity, reversing the spatial direction. Uh, quantum field theories have to obey what's called the CPP theorem. It has to be invariant under the combination of charge, parity, and time reversal. So, that means if you have P and T violation, you have to have CP violation. So if you're odd under PT, you have to also be odd under CP to be even under the total CPP transformation. So let's consider what this looks like in electromagnetic wind. Okay, so the, the, the equivalent term for electromagnetic wind SD new, SD new twiddle. If you work this out in terms of the um, Maxwell stress energy tensor, this SD new, new, which you should be familiar with, then this term looks like E dot B. E is a proper vector, so that means it's odd under parity. If you take vectors in the mirror and you reflect them, they're odd. That proper vectors are odd under parity. However, B is um, not a proper vector. B is, um, you can write B as a movement of charges. So B is odd on the time reversal. 
So if you have a current of charges going in one direction, you use the right hand rule, B goes around like this. I reverse time, the charges go in the other direction, and then therefore the sign of B changes. So B is odd under T. So this term violates T from change of direction of E, and T from, from um, change of direction of B. So it violates PT and thus CP. The same is true of the glue of the glue on term. It's just less familiar to write it out in terms of things like E, like e and D. So you can always, when you violate, uh, if a term violates symmetry, it can therefore it can generate other terms that violate that symmetry under quantum corrections. That's just a general rule um, about about um, quantum corrections. If you have a term that violates symmetry, it will generate lots of all other terms that violate that symmetry. A, a term that violates CP is the neutral electric dipole moment. Um, so why, why, does a, why does an electric dipole moment violate PT and the CP? So this is what the diagram here is showing. So the diagram here shows you a D dipole moment, an electric dipole moment, and a new magnetic dipole moment. For the reasons I said before, the, the uh, magnetic field does not change sign on the parity, but the, but the electric field does. So mu goes up, D goes down. From the T, D remains where it is, so that's the electric dipole moment, but mu changes direction. So this thing, the, the, the uh, electric dipole moment, D and, D and mu in the same direction, violates T and violates T. Does it violate um, individually? Does it violate PT and thus CP? The clickers don't work. So, what I just said before, in QFT, operators in the theory generate all terms consistent with symmetry, thus the group term generates a neutral electric dipole moment. The uh, QCD theta term, it has been it was computed in the 70s, just what the number is for the electric dipole moment of the neutron that it generates. And it generates this term. So this is the electric dipole moment for the neutron. It has the unit E charge on the electron centimeters. Um, and you generate 3.6 times 10 to the minus 16 times whatever this number theta was in your. So, the, the electric dipole moment on the neutron has been measured and it has been measured for many, many years. And um, I just got this plot for its measurements off Wikipedia. So, this is the value of the neutron electric dipole moment measured as a function of year of publication. So, already in the 1950s, it was known that the electric dipole moment on the neutron in these units is smaller than 10 to the minus 19. So, from the previous slide, theta was smaller than 10 to the minus 3. And this has only got worse by orders and orders of magnitude up until today, where we know that theta, or we know the electric dipole moment on the neutron is at least as small as 10 to the minus 26 e centimeters. So this number theta has to be smaller than 10 to the minus 10. So, why is this a problem? This is a problem because um, the theta term has contributions from two separate parts of the standard model of part physics. We have this term, this total term theta. It has the term that I wrote down before, this kind of bare QCD contribution, just a number you're allowed to write down because this G this uh, G G dual term um, is consistent with all the symmetries of the standard model. The standard model violates CP, so you can write down this CP violating term. So you have this bare contribution from QCD. You then also get this other funny contribution from um, the quarks from SU2. And this is the argument of the determinant of the quark mass matrix. So that um, we know that the electroweak sector violates CP in the um, famous Kabibo Kobayashi Masakawa matrix. We measure this, for example, in K on the case. And this tells you that in general, this second term, which comes from the quark mass matrices, should be of order one. You don't know what it is, but it should be of order one. But because the measured term theta 
is very close to zero, we have these two non-zero things that have to cancel at very high precision. So it's a, it's a dimensionless thing, but it has to cancel two parts from the standard model at the, at the level of 10 decimal places at least. So this is the, um, this is why it's a fine tuning problem. So now a little cartoon picture of fine tuning in theoretical physics. Why don't we like it? So we have a Lagrangian, Lagrangian density, which is normally a number times an operator. The number is the value you measure, and the operator tells you what physical effect you should be looking at. So for example, operator, neutral at the moment, number, measure this value the end. And we have fine tuning problems when the number is not just a single number in our Lagrangian that we can write down, but it's a sum of contributions from different areas of physics. So contributions from different forces, in this case, the strong and weak nuclear forces, the SU2 and SU3 sectors of the standard model. So the neutron EDM is measured consistent with zero, and this implies a delicate cancellation at the level of 10 to minus 10, which we don't like. So, how does this get solved? Again, in a kind of cartoon way. So we have spontaneous symmetry breaking. And spontaneous symmetry breaking, we, we get a Goldstone boson theta, which has some continuous shift symmetry. So that's like, you have this spontaneous symmetry breaking potential here. Around the bottom, in the vacuum, there is a, there is a symmetry field that corresponds to motions around this circle. That the action doesn't depend on. So the trick is to get this thing, this, this field theta to couple to your problematic number. So this of course only works if your number is defined modulo 2 pi just like theta and that's part of the trick with these, with these types of operators. So you have a number and you make it number plus your field theta. But then because nothing cares about the value of this field theta, you can just absorb the number into a, into a field redefinition of theta. So now you just end up with a field where before you had a number, and that's the trick. The next thing that comes in to clean up the mess, and we're gonna do this like in different levels of detail, so if you don't follow it now, you'll follow it as we go on. The next thing we have to do is we have to actually break this symmetry for theta. So we do this with something called an instanton, it tilts the potential, and causes the field to roll down to this value. So we tilt this wine bottle potential and theta dynamically moves to its value zero, which is here, and we have no problematic neutral electric cycle moment. So this is, that, they're the ingredients of how the axion solves the problem of the, of the neutron EDM, which we're now going to go into in more detail. So we need a shift symmetry, so we need a field theta that is invariant under shift by some constant number. We then need to arrange our theory such that this field theta couples to the term in the action that we had before where we had this problematic number in front of an operator. And the final thing we need to do is, is have some other dynamics that give the potential to this field theta. So what we do is we have a Goldstone boson, that gives us a field with a shift symmetry for some, for some global U1 symmetry. Then we introduce loops of chiral fermions that make this, that make this symmetry, uh, this U1 symmetry anomalous and couple theta to, to, the, um, to the gluon pair to this GG dual term in QCD. And then finally, QCD does the job for us of making the potential the V of theta um, when QCD becomes strongly coupled. So non-perturbative effects on QCD do this for us. So we're going to do this in more and more detail. What spontaneous symmetry breaking? So we, so we introduce a new complex field that has symmetry. So this is the Petche quid, the so-called Petche quid mechanism. It's achieved by introducing a new complex scalar field curly phi, which I'm going to write as a modulus chi and a phase phi over fa. 
So I, I'm going to be using, as I said, different units um, to what Jens is using. I will always use units where h bar equals c equals 1. And my fields will either have mass dimension 1, the canonically normalized field, by, or I'll use a dimensionless field by over f as a Goldstone boson. And I would put my fields are always going to be dimensionless Goldstone boson uh, or mass dimension one. I will never use any other dimensions for the field. Okay, so then we write down a potential for this complex field phi, which has the following form. This is the normal symmetry breaking potential. So this and um, this term uh, has when phi is equal to zero, has some positive energy density, that's the middle of the wine bottle, and the punt, I think it's called, and, but this potential is minimized when phi takes a non-zero value equal to f over root two. Okay? But this potential only depends on the modulus of phi and not on its phase. Because this, this potential doesn't depend on the phase of phi, it has a symmetry which is multiplication by any member of the group you want. That just means multiply by phase. So we take phi to phi times e to the i alpha for any constant alpha. What that means is that this that changes the con the field phi, um, the field small phi goes to phi plus constant, where that constant is uh, fa times alpha. So this potential is in variance under these shifts in the Goldstone, in the phase of this complex field. So this is the this is this U1 symmetry. This element here is the alpha is an element of the group U1. So spontaneous symmetry breaking. If the temperature, the typical scale of fluctuations of your complex field phi, is much larger than the decay constant then this is, this is FA, this is the K constant, then the field doesn't see the fact that there's a minimum in the potential here. It's just fluctuating and it's localized at zero. It has dead zero. It just sees the large part. And then I write it like this. However, when the temperature drops to be smaller than the scale of the potential, now the field can see that there is a minimum at that point, it falls down into this minimum and takes on its vacuum expectation value, FA over root 2. Yeah. And then we have this field theta, phi over FA, which corresponds to motion around the bottom of the wine bottle. Okay. So now we have to do something more. So we've got our Goldstone boson. We've got a field that is symmetric under some shift. But we have to now couple it to that problematic term in the QCD Lagrangian. So here's the full Lagrangian entity of our complex scale field. Uh, here is d mu phi, d mu phi star for the complex scale field kinetic term and the potential v of phi. This term is invariant under changes in the um, in the Goldstone, if you if you rotate this field by that u1 before that e to the i alpha, you get five five star there. It doesn't change. And I already showed you the is invariant. But now we couple it to some quarks, and we have to do it in this special way with some chiral quarks. So this is size some fermion field, which has two components: the left term and the right term. And the left term and right term are picked out by the projection operators, P left, right, and they can be written in terms of the gamma matrix gamma 5. Gamma 5 is just some 4 by 4 um, matrix that acts on this um, spin of the other side. So, to make this, this new term that I've introduced, this coupling y times phi star times phi left, phi right, I want to make this also invariant under that change in U1, under that E to the I alpha rotation. I want this to be shift symmetric. So to do that, I have to give the fermion a charge under this, under this U1 symmetry. So 
What, what does the charge mean? The charge just means that when I make such a rotation, the fermion fields also change. So I, I define the fermion field when I make this rotation to have charge one, and the Pache Quinn field to have charge two. So here I make some rotation. This thing goes to e to the minus i 2q alpha, the psi star here. The psi left and psi right pick up different rotations. So you write this gamma phi and the sum of p left and minus p right. The left and right hand of fermions have different charges under this U1 symmetry, such that I get 2q in the phase for my psi star, and I get minus 2q in the phase for psi star, and plus 2q from the rotation on psi left and psi right. So that this whole term doesn't change when I make that petrograd rotation parameter alpha. This is now a global symmetry of this action, of this global U1 symmetry. And we know that when we have global symmetries, we have conserved currents from their system. And this symmetry is chiral. This is going to affect fermions that are left and right handed in different ways. And so we have a chiral, uh, the conservation of a chiral code. So here's my field five. I have a conserved current, JUPQ. And the conserved current of this symmetry is the derivative of the phase, derivative of the phase times phi. That's just saying that this field phi is invariant under this constant shift. You can see that if I make, if I add any constant to phi, this deri the derivative kills it. So that's why this current is, is corresponding to that. And the equation of motion for phi, phi is a massless field, so its equation of motion is just d mu phi d mu phi equals zero. D mu, d mu phi equals zero. If you have a massless field of energy, that's its equation of motion. And for this current, j mu pq, it obviously has vanishing divergence just from the equation of motion for that. So it's a conserved current. Okay, now, okay, so we've got this, we've got this Lagrangian, it's completely invariant under the shift symmetry. We still haven't managed to couple the axion to the gluon field strength, though. Yes, question? Why a fermion? Because I have to couple it to the, to the gluons. So this is this, um, the, the, uh, there's going to be an, an anomalous symmetry. Chiral fermions have anomalous symmetries. Um, I'll show you how why that happens. It has to be a fermion because fermions have um, chiral loops that violate symmetry, and I'll show you why. So I want to work out the coupling that between our axion field phi and the fermions after I go into this gauge where I put the whole field on there. So. Spontaneous symmetry breaking happens. I replace the complex field phi with its bed. Um, in the jargon, you say you integrate it out. So now I say, okay, I just put my um, complex field on bed, and then I want to get rid of my complex field. I just want to say that it sits at the minimum of its potential. So I do this. But, not, but I want to check that in doing that, I don't miss any interactions between the field phi in the, in the argument and the, um, and the other fields in the theory. And I can do that with the following trick. So I promote the U1 rotation alpha that we made before to, have got, um, to actually be the dynamical field by over X. And I see what happens. So I just make a field redefinition. When I make a field redefinition that looks like this, so I just make all my field redefinitions that look like my previous rotation to try and pull out what the, what the interactions look like that were hidden by going into this case. Because when you have a spontaneously broken symmetry, the symmetry isn't broken, it's just hidden from you, it's just non-linearly realized. 
So we have to look for where it might hide. So we make this field redefinition. And we substitute this field redefinition into the fairly kinetic term. So this field redefinition, all of the um, terms in the Lagrangian earlier are invariant not just under the global rotation, psi goes to e to the i alpha times psi, but also under the local rotation. The, the only term that is not invariant under the local rotation is the fermion kinetic term. So this is the fermion kinetic term, i psi bar gamma mu d mu psi. If psi is the, psi is the uh, fermion spinner field, psi bar is the emission conjugate times gamma zero, and gamma mu are the um, Dirac term on matrices. But now when I substitute in this field redefinition, into the fermion kinetic term, I end up with a non zero coupling between the fermions and my field phi. And this is where the interaction hides. So if I just took my action before and substituted in this spontaneous symmetry breaking term, then let me just do that. So if you just substitute in, put this field by on red, then you would see no interactions between the um, Petri and field and the fermion. But that's because you, you made a, you, just, you fixed a field where you weren't meant to fix it. So you have to allow for that new variation around the bottom of the wine bottle by making this local rotation, which was this one, this local rotation. Psi goes to psi prime. E to the IQ gamma phi of phi over F. And it makes an interaction appear from the fermion kinetic term. So this is the way that the interaction of the goldstone with the fermions appears. This term is still manifestly invariant under the rotation, under the Petri frame rotation by a constant. If I just shift my field by a constant, this term still doesn't care because a derivative is acting on phi. But I see that there is an interaction between the Petri Quinn current, D mu phi, and the axial fermion current. So this is how you have you have this uh, current from this from the from Nerf's theorem, and the current of the conserved symmetry coupled to the corresponding fermion current, which is this axial fermion current because it contains the gamma phi. And you've never seen gamma phi before. Um, I'll just put you back again. This thing here. We call things with gamma phi the axial because they are part of these projection operators, the left and right, that project out the left and right handed components of fermions. This is all just, this is all just, I mean, essentially classical in this area. Okay. So now we've got a, a Lagrangian which contains a massless field, small phi. Coupled to um, a fermion uh, current. And this is going to lead to the famous chiral anomaly, uh, which I'm going to try and sketch the, uh, the derivation of on the blackboard. But I'll tell you what's going to happen first. So, this is where we're going to do some quantum, quantum theory. So, what you have in, in quantum theory is a Feynman diagram. Feynman diagrams lead to interactions between particles. At the quantum level, you are allowed to have loops of particles mediating interactions. Loops go like order h bar. What, um, what this means is that you can also generate new types of interaction. So a loop, here I've got an interaction between my field phi, some fermions q, and some gluons g. So the fermions couple to the gluons, just like fermions couple to the electromagnetism. This can look like an interaction here, just between phi and the gluons. For example, here, if momentum going around the loop is smaller than the quark momentum. This is just like in electroweak theory, um, where you have, for example, and I've got it looks like, um, so you have. In electroweak theory, you have scattering of fermions by exchange of a W boson. But if the momentum exchange of the fermions 
is small, small compared to W mass. Q squared much less than W squared. Then you replace these interactions with core fermion interactions. This always happens in, 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 in quantum field theory if the momentum exchange is smaller than the mass of the particle. In the case of this loop here, it actually doesn't matter what the masses of the quarks are. What happens is, is you compute some loop and you have some divergent part, um, which I'm not going to talk about, and then you also have a finite part and you can replace this divergent loop with just its finite interaction after the normalization. And that's what we're going to try and compute. We're going to try and say, what would this look like in Feynman rules here? Yeah. And that's what I'm going to try and sketch for you now. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides. And now for the others, you will hopefully see me standing at the blackboard. I'm going to try and guide you through some elements of that calculation. Which I don't know. And this is just to try this is just to try and demystify in some sense where this kind of anomaly comes from. So in order to, to, in order to do some make some progress here, we need to write down the final rules. So the final rules to tell you how to turn those squiggly diagrams that are a little bit intuitive into mathematical expressions. So the ones we're going to need are this rule, which says what happens when we have an external scalar, that equals one. External scalars just don't do anything. We need to say what happens when we have an interaction between two fermions and a gauge boson, <coughs> in this case, a gluon, and gluon A is this. Is equal to I, G, where G is the coupling with your, of your gauge group, gamma mu gamma matrix, TA, those generators that we saw before. So this is the fairly effect. We need to know what happens when we have an external V1. So anything with an external V1, with an momentum T and index A. Oh, we don't care about the A actually. We get a polarization vector, E mu, which is the function of momentum. We get E mu if it's the glue in the initial state. And we get E mu complex conjugate if it's the glue in the final state. This is an extra glue on. We need the rule that we got from our axial fermion interaction. So we had that interaction between the axial current and the fermions in our Lagrangian. So all of these just correspond to terms in the Lagrangian. Like this term here corresponds to an uh, A mu uh, phi bar gamma mu phi <coughs> type term. These two come from our kinetic term, well, um, from the external. Um, the axial fermion vertex. This is equal to minus i q over f p mu gamma mu gamma five, where p is momentum exchange. Q is the charge of the fermions that we defined earlier. This is the axial fermion vertex. Uh, this came from the terminal of Rangium P by Psi by Psi. So there are rules, I mean, so there are, there are rules that you can look up basically and in any DSP textbook to tell you how to tell the um, terminal of Rangium into rules for drawing Feynman diagrams. You replace D 
mu by momenta, d mu phi becomes momentum with a minus i, and then you eliminate fields. Okay, we need one more thing, and this is the thing that's going to be really key. Um, this is this is what leads to all the magic. This means the fermion propagator. This is what tells us to do with fermion inside our diagram. But everything else you just saw, like right, you have a, we are going to have external scalars, external gluons, um, axial fermion vertices. All of this stuff would just lead to a big messy expression. The thing that's important is the things internal to the loops in this case. So these are our fermion propagators, which I write as I T slash plus M over T squared minus M squared, where uh, P slash, I'm going to use direct slash notation, where P slash is gamma mu contracted with T. The gamma means behave like four vectors, so I can contract them. And then using the identity, um, using some identities, you can show that this can equivalently be written as one over p slash minus n, where this means the um, inverse matrix. Because these gammas are a matrix, a matrix value thing. The gammas are matrix value things. So there's non so, so the, the fermion lines. Don't commute with each other, and this is this is the um, this is where the magic comes from. So this is the fermion propagator, and this is what we need. Okay, I should have used the platforms in a different order. Um, apologies to people who are back with particle physics in me. Um, because as I said, I haven't done at least for about nine years. We'll see how we'll see how we go. Okay. So now we've written down our rules, and now we write down our diagrams, we translate our diagrams into rules, and then we just generate the diagrams that we need. I've drawn one already. This one has a field phi going in with momentum Q. I have a gluon going out with momentum T, a gluon going out with momentum K. My gluon is a vector, so I need to get some vector indices. This one has index mu, this one has index lambda. I then need um, a momentum corresponding to the momentum that runs around the loop. So the particles in the loop can have any momentum. I, have, I need to introduce a momentum, I need to break over it, which is something that's not really part of the final rule, but kind of is. Um, I suppose it is. You need to do one um, is integral d4 t over 2 pi to the 4 for a closed loop. Um, and you also need a minus 1 for a closed so you have a momentum in a loop. T going around it, and you have to integrate over it, and you get minus one for a cross Okay, so I need to put a loop momentum on. So I'm going to put a loop momentum L running here, and then you apply momentum conservation at each of x. So this momentum here has to be L minus K, because K goes out, L goes in, L minus K goes this way. Then here, this momentum here, has to be L plus P, because um, here, L has to come out, and P has to come out, so L plus P has to go in. So now I've labeled my first diagram. I also need what's called the crossing symmetry version of this. Because in the end, I don't care which glue on which when it comes out. So you have to do a slightly relabeled version of this. Where the glue on going out to the different labels. So I keep this group, this one here now has momentum T and index mu, and this one here has momentum K and lambda. And this changes the uh, order of the fermion. 
the moment that L to K L um, say L to K L L minus T and so much K and T going in. So now we just go around the loop and write down what these terms look like. <coughs> Uh, and, then, and, then. Ah. and we also always need in our best set five minerals overall momentum conservation two pi to the four uh, the rack delta function of four dimensions so the next step momentum conservation. So I'm going to factorize um, my loop in the following way. So I have this as equal to minus i q. This is the from the axiom fermion interaction, the axiom momentum. Then I have two external blue ones, the two blue ones, two blue one polarizations, epsilon mu p, epsilon lambda k. I have my momentum conservation, two times the four, delta four p plus k minus q, overall momentum conservation, and then a matrix element which I'm going to write like this. The matrix element has to, this, this overall has to be a scalar. So my matrix element has to have three Lorentz indices, mu, mu, lambda. Um, upstairs. And now I'm going to write down what that, um, what that matrix element is. So this matrix element is for my, my two different terms now. And so I'm just going to focus on this one and then write down the second one by symmetry. Because you see that this one just involves changes between K and P and U and lambda. Okay. So what is M? M U lambda is equal to, so I, I still haven't used my Q over S from back to the X. So first of all, I need that. And I, I need um, a minus sign to my close fermion loop. And minus q over f. Um, I'm going to get first of all all the stuff that isn't a matrix, and I have to make sure I put the matrices in the right order because they don't come with each other. And first of all, I'm just going to write all the non-matrix stuff. So I've got my q over f, and I've got um, a couple of g's here, and the uh, t matrices. I uh, don't carry any spin in this area, so they just fall out as well. So I get an IG squared from my variable vertex, IG squared, I have two, I have two blue ones, TA, TB, that they're interacting with. And now I've got all the special stuff. The gala matrices, which is what we have to be careful about. Uh, can everyone see if it's okay where it's okay? So I need to integrate over loop momentum. Integral d4 L over 2 pi to the 4. I have to trace over all of my spin indices. So I'm going to have a whole bunch of gamma matrices running around here. And I have to make sure that I don't have any spin, spin indices hanging about. So I have to trace, I'm going to use small trace to be the trace over spin. I'm going to use big trace for something else later. And now we have to go around the loop, and this is where we have to be careful. So, what do we need? First of all, we get our axion fermion vertex here. So we get a gamma mu, gamma phi. Gamma mu, gamma phi. Now we have to write three fermion propagators and the gammas from the fermion blue on there to see. So what are we going to do? We're going to go fermion, fermion propagator, 
with proper momentum back. Remember that these things are uh, making the value in the space. We're going to go fairly unpropagate that, gamma from the vertex. Fairly unpropagate that, gamma from the vertex. Fairly unpropagate that is what this is going to look like. Yeah, we get semi propagator I L slash minus P slash over L minus over L minus P squared. I'm going to assume that my semi are massless, and they does not make a difference whether they have mass or not for the purposes of this. Then I have gamma mu i l squared over l squared. This fermion propagates over l plus p slash over l minus p squared. I got gamma mu in the strong vertex i l slash over l squared. Then I'm going to get gamma lambda i l slash minus k slash over l minus k squared. The next bit. So we have uh, yeah. I've got my gamma and my lambda is going to be going to be going to be going to be I L slash plus K slash gamma lambda I L plus plus K slash over L plus K squared. I was writing down here this one. <laughs> Okay. You have to go around the fermion backwards. You have to go around the fermion in the same way. I should have done it. But the whole thing is cyclic, so that shouldn't be matter. But it's a trace, trace is cyclic. So, this is the object that we have. Now, some of this time, I've got about 45 minutes left. Um, so, what are the important things about this? So, first of all, let's think about the, the things that are to do with the past content and the, the things that are to do with computation. So, we've got a big old integral that's to do with computation, and we'll deal with that later. And at some, at some stage, I'll just state the results about it because I'm not going to do the normalization. Um, but the most important thing about this is the particle content here. So, this is for one set of fermions going around my loop with charges Q and interacting with gluons in representations given by Tn. Where is it fairly on representation? So generally, so I have my I have this particle content right and I need to sum over it. I could have more than one type of particle running around this loop. I could have many, many quarks charged under my symmetry. And then I would have to sum up all of them. And this thing is just a number. But this thing I can sum over all my particles. Uh, Um, I need to do one more bit of gymnastics before I define what I want. Um, I know that is it. So we can we can simplify this uh, bit, which is just a group theory factor. So, it, I'm going to have to sum over all the articles, 
store over all catch equals charged by the dog. That gives me B trace, which just means sum of particles that can just in, times Q P A Q B. Sum over the particles and sum over the representations in which they interact with the one. And I want to define, and this is just a number, and this may or may not vanish. And I'm just going to define that two times this number is equal to some other number C called the color anomaly times the chronic delta in the AB color indices. So this whole loop would vanish if I had lots and lots of particles in it. I could arrange this entire loop does nothing if the sum of the particles all adds up to zero. Then I don't have to care what the integral was if this C is zero. This is what I mean by this is a good theory factor. Or, but on the other hand, if, that inter if my integral is non zero, this is just something I like to compute. And this will be the same for all theories. If this thing is non zero, then the whole contribution of this loop to physics is determined now just by this number, which is just sum over the particle content in my theory. So this is, this is, it's important to see where this structure comes from. And this thing C is called a color anomaly. Okay. So, I'm just going to simplify the integral a little bit. We're going to get the structure of it. Um, we want to get it to the right structure, and then I'll, I won't bother evaluating it numerically. Okay. So, first of all, in my whole matrix element, we are contracting the matrix element of Q. Q mu contracts with this matrix element. And I've got a gamma mu, gamma phi inside my integral. So by writing, by using momentum conservation, I'm writing Q equals T plus 10. I have my overall momentum conserving delta function, Q goes in, T and K go out, so Q has to equal P plus 10. I can write Q mu gamma mu gamma 5 as equal to P slash plus L slash plus K slash minus L slash and down five. Q with gamma mu gives me slashes. I write Q is equal to P plus K. So I just added and subtracted L. When I do this, um, uh, this is where I should have written the right one here. So I should have had an L minus K and an L minus K, L plus Okay. And I use my identity from before with Feynman rules. My identity before from the Feynman rules is that I P slash plus M and P squared minus M squared is equal to and P slash minus M. And notice that this Q mu contraction, Q mu, gamma mu, gamma 5, I can get two slashes, two contributions of slashes upstairs that cancel contributions and slashes downstairs in the of propagation. I get one term that cancels one part and one term that cancels the other. Okay, so I split this integral into two pieces 
one that has um, one fewer fairly unpropagated cancer than the other. Okay. <clears throat> And then, what do I know? So I've cancelled two factors of gamma matrices. So how many how many gamma matrices did I have in this row? I had gamma mu, gamma nu, gamma lambda. That's three. But then I have three propagators. One, two, three. I'm five. I use this contraction with Q to, to cancel the um, gamma matrix, the spin, the spins in two of these propagators, but not in the but not in the third one. So in the end, I'm going to have four gamma matrix indices. Here. I'm going to have four gamma matrices and then the right number of momenta to contract with them. So this is the, the symmetry properties. So I need four gamma matrices, which I'm going to pull up the front and trace over, and then just a, a load of momentum integral. Is it clear how that happens? Or is it really clear? Can you say again why we have four in the end? Okay, so we have four in the end because we've got our gamma mu from the axial vertex, gamma mu gamma phi from the axial vertex, gamma mu gamma lambda from the gluon vertices. Then we've got three um, gamma matrix factors from the three fermion on propagators. However, I contracted this q mu gamma mu to kill two of the Oh, I should have just tried one of them. Aha, no. But this Q slash, this kills the mu, it turns this into a slash, which cancels one of these. And then I have one, two, three, and then. Let's say my Q slash cancels this one. And then I have a gamma phi, gamma nu, gamma, gamma, gamma. One, two, three, four. Okay? That's the symmetry structure. The symmetry structure is um, I had a Q slash, which cancelled one of my fermion propagators, but then I still have two fermion propagators and two gluons. So the, the axion vertex cancels one of my fermion propagators, basically. <laughs> so now, my total matrix element is going to look like, and I'm just going to, I'll, I'll write up some notes with all the factors collected, I'm just going to do the symmetry properties now. So this matrix element is going to have my colour factor um, from the first trace, then it's going to have a trace of a gamma 5, and four gamma matrices, mu, mu, alpha, theta. And then it has to contract with the right type, and then it's going to have an integral. Okay, the integral has to contract all of these indices, mu, mu, alpha, theta, and could be a function of, of momentum. What um, the rent quantities do I have to make this integral? The only vectors I have to make this integral are I have epsilon and for my external uh, let me use lambda rho there you go. Uh, lambda rho because what do I have? I have mu and lambda external with each my gluons. So I have uh, gluon polarization Epsilon, epsilon, that can live inside that, that can contract with these. And then I have the glue on momentum. So I've used my axial momentum. So I have my glue on momentum, uh, P and K. Right? So it has to go like P 
mu k times that is some number which is just an integral. Okay. So we've written down now all of the symmetry structure of this of this matrix element. <coughs> Color anomaly, trace over four gamma matrices times gamma five, external gluons. The only vectors that are available to is a P and K. So they have to do the rest of the contrasting by symmetry and then some integral. The integral tends up to be divergent and you have to evaluate it in say um, dimensional regularization, um, which you can see in Pascal and Schroeder, or something like that. And the point is that this has a finite contribution. There is a finite contribution to this that doesn't vanish from the normalization. And the, the thing I have to show you now, just to make everything right, is what is the, is the result for this trace and these. So you notice first that these epsilons and P's are exactly what you get for external gluons interacting with things. So these, if you wanted Feynman rules for these, you have an F mu nu. Well, we want the momentum P and polarization epsilon. And an F mu nu, we want the momentum K and polarization epsilon lambda. So you would get this Lorentz structure from a terminal of energy that just had two uh, gluon field strengths. The final piece of the puzzle is the trace. And the trace is really a special thing. And the result that you use, just result for gamma matrix traces, so you can look up in any textbook on the The rule is trace gamma five. Gamma nu, gamma nu, gamma sigma, gamma lambda, gamma rho, is equal to minus 4 i epsilon nu, nu, lambda. So now we've got that term that we had before, this GG dual term. You now recognize this thing. So our matrix element looks like we could get it has C, 4i, epsilon, mu, mu, rho, mu, mu, lambda, rho, epsilon, mu, t, uh, lambda, epsilon, mu, is that right? Epsilon, mu, t, <laughs> Mu, epsilon, lambda, k, rho. So we could get the Feynman rule for that. At tree level, from the terminal of the Grandian, proportional to C, epsilon mu nu, lambda rho, F mu nu, G mu nu, G lambda rho. Epsilon, contrast our G's, this is the GG dual term. And its coefficient is this thing, the color anomaly. Okay. Any questions? We wrote down on a red structure, we wrote down our symmetry structure in terms of particles. We wrote down our spin structure in terms of how many gamma matrices do we have. 
Um, we did this trick where we had a queue slash and we used to cancel one of our downstairs ones from the proper data. And then we use this identity to trace it to give us an epsilon and the symmetric data. Okay? Didn't you have a find in the question? Yes, I should. Because yeah. I needed to get um, also my external scalar and the factor of one in the Feynman rule. Yeah, that's very important. I need my five. Um, this term, this, this interaction is equivalent to just this. Yeah, because I needed my Q mu going in to do that. Do that business. So I can replace all of that loop mesh with a tree level term that couples an axion to two gluons. I get one gluon from that field check, polarization mu, mu, momentum index mu, one gluon from this field check, and the epsilon takes care of all of the Dirac gamma traces and stuff like that. The color anomaly C takes care of all the particle content, what particles are running around in my loop, and then there is a numerical factor that just has to be evaluated. But it is not my machine. Okay, so that's the Cairo anomaly. I'm now going to switch back to sharing my slides with you, which I hope I put the right one. Yeah, okay, so we're now back to the slides. There we are, chiral anomaly. So this means that I can replace my action with all that complicated axion fermion interaction with just, uh, well, you know, I, I can replace it at the level of this loop with an interaction between the axions and the blue ones. I still have my axion fermion interaction. But I also have this new interaction that has been generated at one loop between the axioms and the blue ones. We looked at the back one. And this is where everything starts working now. This is where the axion starts to solve the geometry problem. So, accounting for this anomaly, we can now rewrite the axion Lagrangian as the following. I have my kinetic term for the axion, which came from the kinetic term that we wrote down for the complex Petri-Quinn field, curly five. I have my interaction between the axions and the fermions, which comes from this derivative, which we derived from the fermion kinetic pair, and the axial fermion current, psi bar gamma mu gamma phi psi. Then I have now my gluon field strength tensor. But as well as phi set that we originally wrote down, which was the sum of these two numbers, one from, one from TCD, one from um, one from the electroweak vector, but I now have this new coupling between the field phi, the goldstone, by a and this color anomaly factor. As long as I choose my particle context, such as this color anomaly factor is not zero, I've, I've achieved my goal of coupling my axion to the real one. This is important because this term is not invariant under the shift phi goes to phi plus a constant. Every other term here, phi goes, phi goes to phi plus a constant, these two terms don't change because the derivative hits the constant and it vanishes. This term changes. Every term is invariant under the shift symmetry except theta. So now I just make a field redefinition. Shift theta by a constant. So shift phi by a constant. I shift phi by the constant. Um, phi goes to phi prime equals phi plus fa over the color anomaly times theta. Now, in terms of phi prime, theta has disappeared. Okay, so phi prime is um, so small, so phi is equal to phi prime minus fa over c times theta. All the other terms don't change, I just get kinetic term phi prime, coupled between phi prime and fermion currents, bang, no theta. This is the magic. 
You have something that is completely invariant under a shift symmetry, except for something where it generates that anomalous um, by this group anomaly itself from something that was originally invariant. And now you've got rid of um, theta. I got rid of theta and I turned theta into just some, some field phi, but my field phi is still massless. I still haven't solved my problem. Phi can still take on any value that it wants, and there's nothing to pick the special value. Now we need to pick the special value. Okay, so we see that the problematic um, term, uh, theta term, can be absorbed in a phi definition. So Q is theta in the um, symbol um, font. So sometimes you see Qs where you see theta. But now we need dynamics to set phi equal to zero. So now enter these strange, uh, these strange beasts called instantons. And we need to find a potential for the axiom. So even if we didn't have an axiom, and this is what was known before Petra and Quinn came along, even if we didn't have an axiom, the vacuum energy actually depends on this term theta. So um, if theta is a constant, the classical equations of motion do not depend on theta. You can work them out. You could work it up to the, to, say, the electromagnetic version where it has theta e dot b. Work up the equivalence of Maxwell's equation to this new term. Nothing appears in the equations of motion if theta is a constant. But at the quantum mechanical level, something does happen. And this is due to something called the theta vacua of QCD, for which I refer to the book by Coleman that I mentioned in the further reading. Um, to explain what these things about to are. And, and Coleman shows that the energy density, in the case of now it's this, these non abelian fields, these self interacting fields like gluons or like um, electric gauge bosons, the vacuum energy does depend on this value theta. <coughs> Furthermore, there is a theorem known as the Wasser Witten theorem that guarantees that the minimum of this energy dependence of the vacuum is at the value that conserves CP. So QCD by itself conserves CP, doesn't know anything about CP violations, only the electric weak sector does. This term, when we've rewritten it now in terms of this, um, this gauge boson, uh, sorry, this axiom, doesn't know anything about the electric weak sector either. So it has to conserve the symmetries of the SU3 sector. So this is this last of Witten theorem. The minimum of the of the energy um, is at the CP conserving value where the term vanishes. So now the goal of the action is to connect these different um, uh, these different so-called super selection sectors to minimize the energy by dynamics. So the problem was that people saw in the past that the energy density of, the, of, of QCD, the vacuum energy, depended on this number theta. But they also knew that theta can't change. So there's something called a super selection that says, yeah, sure, the energy density depends on theta, but theta is fixed. It has no dynamics. It will just is the value that it is. The trick is to couple a dynamical field to the same operator, generate a potential, and minimize the energy by dynamics. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on this now. So what we do is the vacuum energy depends on theta. We rewrite our Lagrangian as an effective Lagrangian, which is the Lagrangian before, minus this vacuum energy, because we, we subtract off potentials. And now we've got a dynamical field. This is equivalent to having a potential for phi. So if you find that your, that your vacuum energy depends on some parameter, you can just Put that back. It put the vacuum energy into your Lagrangian as a potential for that um, value. And in this case, it would depend on the field file which we have coupled to the operator. So, what do we know about this vacuum energy? So, this is derived in some approximation um, in Coleman, and you, and you can see it. Uh, but I will just state some facts about it. So the potential must be periodic. Um, so that's because uh, theta is angular. So, so this, so this, um, the Argolton boson 
has to come, because it's a complex field, it has to come back to itself when we rotate once in the mm -hmm. complex plane. So the potential has to be periodic. The potential for phi has to come back to itself under this shift by phi goes to phi plus two pi times the decay constant. Because, yeah, theta is phi over f in this. So the appearance of this potential is not something that you will see in perturbation theory, not something that appears from loops to non perturbative effect in TCD. Um, but the magnitude should therefore depend on the strong coupling scale of TCD to any scale available. The potential we write as some dimensions, so potentials have mass dimension four um, in natural units. So we write it as some dimension four thing, chi, called the topological susceptibility, which has mass dimension four, times a dimensionless periodic function. We know that this, um, this effect is, um, is non perturbative um, for QCD. But at zero temperature, <laughs> when QCD becomes strongly coupled, it should be avoided the strong coupling scale of QCD to the fourth power. So the right units at zero temperature, strong, QCD is strongly coupled. This goes like random to the fourth. At infinite temperature, QCD is um, asymptotically free. Weakly interacting, so the non perturbative effect should vanish. So, at infinite temperature, this thing has to go to zero. These are, ob these are obvious statements um, when you think about QCD. So, we have to calculate the function u, we have to calculate the scale lambda, and we know that the, that the topological susceptibility goes to zero at infinite temperature because of asymptotic freedom. And this function chi, in general, also needs calculating what is its temperature dependent. But we know it's asymptotic behavior. So have I got about 15 minutes left? Yeah. We will get to where we need to get to. Okay. So, first of all, what's the axial mass? We can get the mass from this. So U, we know that this potential U has a minimum. Um, and we know that it has a minimum at the CP conserving value phi equals zero. That was from the Vassal Witten theorem. So any potential with a minimum, we can expand around its minimum, make a Taylor expansion. And the first term will go like phi squared. Okay, at a minimum, the first, the first derivative vanishes. So you just have a term that goes like phi squared, and that means that you get a mass. So is that clear to everybody? Does anyone know why that's good? Okay, good. So we expand the potential to quadratic order, we get a potential that looks like up now phi squared. So that's a mass term. <coughs> so if chi goes like lambda q to the four, I expand this. I get phi squared over f squared, so I get lambda to the 4 over f squared times phi squared. So lambda to the 4 over f squared is the mass. So you could do this just dimensional analysis argument and get the mass 4 times 10 to the minus 5 EV times 10 to the 12 GEV over the decay constant for the actual mass. This is the, original, this is the estimate that was done in, what, in um, Wilczek's paper. In 1978, um, just dimensional analysis basically of lambda QCD. Um, you can get a little bit more details on this if you do what's called chiral perturbation theory, um, which is um, done in more detail in, in Weinberg's uh, 78 paper. And there you find that this isn't actually lambda QCD to the four, because it turns out that this effect that gives you these potentials would vanish, would be able to be absorbed if the quarks were massless. Um, so you have to have something in front of this that vanishes when, when, when any of the quarks become massless. And for just two light quarks, the U's and D's, assuming that, that you know the strange mass is much larger than the U's and D's, and the form of this term is like this, square root MU, MD over MU plus MD. This vanishes if either MU or MD goes to zero. M pi and pi is basically lambda QCD squared. Okay, so you get 
Some things that depend on the on the like quark masses, so you get a slightly different number. So the axial mass, you know, pretty close by order of within an order of magnitude though. And I've just chosen a value of f to quote it at. Clearly, the axial mass in this case is inversely proportional to the k constant. <coughs> Entire perturbation theory, you can also calculate the, uh, the zero temperature um, shape of the potential, and it's this complicated function here, but it's periodic in, in theta. You can also work at finite temperature. So, chiral perturbation theory is working at zero temperature when you have, um, where QCD is strongly coupled, and you have pions as the, as the relevant field. Um, finite temperature, you can do what was done in the Coleman example, or do what's called the dilute instanton gas. So QCD is um, relatively weakly coupled, but we still have this, um, these non perturbative effects of F-plus press, um, but you can, you, can, you can calculate what's going on um, in this dilute instanton gas. And then the potential can be computed in a couple of pages um, in this exercise in Coleman. And you find that u of theta is equal to one minus cosine theta. And the important thing, one of the important things to say here is that this one is just a choice to solve the cosmological constant problem. You know that u is minus cosine theta because that's minimized at theta equals zero. One is just we set the minimum to be at zero. Uh, this one has to be chosen for precision of lambda QCD to the four over the current vacuum energy to the four. So this is what this you just choose this. This is because we don't we don't know how to solve the cosmological constant problem. Then this is really yeah, lambda. Okay. Um, then again we we can tailor expand the potential at the minimum, and we can write the uh, temperature dependence of the uh, topological susceptibility as a, as a temperature dependence of the axial mass. The axial mass takes, therefore, we could parameterize it as a power law. We know it has to go to zero when the temperature is infinite. So we can write it as a power law um, compared to the scale lambda QCD. So it gets, when T is larger than lambda QCD, this mass goes to zero. In this approximation, this value of instant of gas, you can actually compute this. You can compute n. You can also compute logarithmic corrections to this, which you can look up the formulae for. I can find them for you if you're interested. Um, and then there are, you know, variations on this where instead of the dilute instant on gas, you have an interacting instant on liquid. And you can calculate this the dependence of this function um, for finite temperature. The important thing is what is the value of n. Uh, this is a famous number computed, well, talked about in a review by Gross et al. in 1974. Um, n, the power law index of the axial mass squared, is 11 times the number of colors plus the number of flavors divided by 6 minus 2. The number of flavors should be the number of active flavors. So for temperatures um, less than the strange mass, um, yeah, the temperature is less than the strange mass, but um, but before the strong coupling temperature of QCD, you have three active flavors, the up down strange, so an F is equal to three. But of course, the power law will change as the, as the temperature becomes higher when you make the when you make the charm quark active, B, T, etc. So this N runs with temperature, um, but in this kind of range between lambda QCD and about a GED, which is the charm quark mass, you just plug in the numbers and n is equal to four. This is a famous uh, number in this game. This just comes from QCD. So the reason I'm writing it like this is you can imagine how this generalizes. If I have some axion and particle coupled onto some other hidden strongly coupled sector, I can choose then the number of colors and flavors in that sector and have some different n if I want to. So let's start just plot and, co and collect um, what I've just told you about the axiom mass. So first of all, the potentials. This is the 
uh, to see the axial potential as a function of a star a is minus five, and a over s taken from the paper by Du Cortona et al, who did the chiral perturbation theory calculations at higher order in second order, um, I think, chiral perturbation theory for corrections. And you see that this chiral perturbation theory potential, which is in blue, and that is in the same gas, have slightly different shapes at large values of the field, and they are high. This will be relevant when we can see the relevant density later. Um, but they're the same shape near zero. Interestingly, it's not known how to go between these two. So nobody knows what, how the shape changes as a function of temperature. We only know the shape in the asymptotic limit. So the topological susceptibility is a little bit better. Because the topological susceptibility, you can compute it using the lattice. The lattice QCD people can just tell you chi of t. But they can't tell you v of theta. Well, at least no one, no one has done it yet. No one has, no one has done a lattice QCD simulation of an axiom actually worked out the shape of the potential. But they can work out the topological susceptibility. Um, so this is in a uh, paper by Borsani and company, a um, group in Warsaw from 2016, and they computed the temperature dependence of the topological susceptibility um, with uh, three active quarks, the up down strange, um, on the lattice. They find that high temperatures, the correct minus four scaling of the topological susceptibility, and then you see that when the temperature drops below the QCD strong coupling scale, a few hundred, um, about a hundred and a bit MeV, then chi goes to a constant value. So this is how I would normally parameterize the dependence by a power law followed by a constant. But this is now verified in gory detail in lattice QCD simulations. In the last five minutes, I just want to tell you now like, what are the different models on the table for actually on this. So I said the important, one of the important things is the particle content. What particles do I allow to run in my loop that sets this color in my mind? What, what fermions are there that are charged under this new symmetry that they quit? How do they interact with the axis? Then, what is this field that I've introduced, the Petrie Quinn field? Is it the Higgs? Is it related to the Higgs? Who knows? So now I'm going to run through the three kind of benchmark models that differ in these different respects and um, tell you what their particle content is. The first one is the historically first model, the Petrie Quinn Wine Bed World Checkout Field. So what I said is the models differ by the chosen matter content. They give us different anomaly coefficients and different freedom in the decay constant. And the one they will check, particularly one they will check out the model. They say, let's be as minimal as possible. Let's make this new field phi that I've introduced the Higgs. So, in order to get things right, they have to have two Higgses. They have to have the normal Higgs to give mass to the up type quarks, and then this new um, field to give mass to the down type quarks. Two Higgs Gilbert model, and um, you have four electromagnetically neutral scalars. You have the Higgs and um, the field that gives mass to the Z. You have the radial Petrie Quinn field and the axion. So you have to introduce two new degrees of freedom, but they made them part of the Higgs mechanism in order to have no free parameters. This model has no free parameters. And um, because now you know how all the fermions of the standard model have to be charged under the Petrie Quinn symmetry in order to make the Higgs terms invariant under this Petrie Quinn symmetry. You also know what this decay constant has to be. You know what the bed of the field is, because in the Higgs theory, the bed of the Higgs is the mass of the W. You know the mass of the W, you know the bed of the Higgs, even before you've discovered it. This was known you know, way before the Higgs was discovered in 2012. The bed is 250 GeV. The F is 250 GeV. In that case, the axiom is heavy, 24 keV. Um, but this model was excluded almost immediately. And that's because you've got a new massless scalar. The axiom was, okay, not massless, I just heavy. Heavy from dark matter point of view. It's very light from a QCD point of view. 
you've got a light axial scalar coupled to all the fermions of the standard model with a coupling constant that you know. So you just go and look for it anyway. So this was excluded almost immediately. Um, one of the things that excluded it was beam dump experiments. And uh, the next model to look at is really simple. It's called the KSCD model. Um, Kim Schiffman, and Weinstein, Zakharov. They introduced, um, as well as the Petri Quinn field, one new quark field. So they introduced a new Dirac quark. Um, it's charged in the Petri Quinn symmetry in the standard model. And its standard model representation is this. So Q has representation R under SU3. Um, it's an SU2 singlet and representation Q under PQ. So it's charged small Q under PQ um, and R for SU3. It has to be charged under SU3 in order to give us the um, give us the loop in order to couple to the long and give us anything. It has to have some non-trivial representation of SU3, has to have some non-trivial representation of PQ. Oh sorry, no, Q is a PQ, Q is the electromagnetic charge. It can have an electromagnetic charge. Um, has to have an SU3 charge. The canonical choice for these representations is to be in the triplet of SU3 and have zero um, electroweak charge. You then plug in this definition, these charges into our definition of color anomaly, which is written on the blackboard. For those of you not looking at the blackboard, because that it's two types of traits of the Petri quid charge and the generated of the SU3 representations. So you do, you do this trace and the, find the color anomaly is equal to one. You have then this interaction Lagrangian that we wrote down before. Petri Quinn scalar phi interaction with uh, interaction with Q left, Q right. Uh, this gives mass to the Q field when the um, when the Petri Quinn scalar takes on a So the Q field, so this new quark is heavy, it has a mass of order the epsilon decay constant. Lambda is of order Fx, phi is of order Fa. Um, and no other particle context, only this um, SU3 quark is charged under Petri Quinn symmetry. So this model is called the hadronic axiom. So only, you only have coupling to the, to the SU3 set set. Basically, this, uh, this GG dual coupling. And then um, you generate an electromagnetic coupling that we'll talk about later. Uh, but it doesn't couple to left on. All the couplings to left on are deep suppressed. The other famous benchmark model that differs from this in two important respects <laughs> is the so called DSSV model, um, which came out uh, slightly later than KFBZ, and Diane Fisher, Shudnicki, and Dittnicki. Um, they don't introduce any new quarks, but they do introduce more scalars. So they take a variant of Petri Quinn Weinberg will check, um, but they allow the, the Petri Quinn field to be a standard model singlet, so it doesn't interact, it doesn't interact and have those problems of beam dump experiment. And it now has a free bed because it's not tied to the Higgs. But they allow for it that they have these two Higgs doublets that they allow to be charged on the Petri Quinn. So now all the interaction with the standard model. Is written down initially, you write down this potential here. So this tells you that the Higgses carry Petri Quinn charge, and thus that every single standard model fermion carries Petri Quinn charge. So this um, interaction V phi squared HT has to be invariant of the Petri Quinn. So phi rotates, so Higgs has to rotate, but we know Higgs interacts with standard model fermions, so they have to rotate. So to make the whole thing invariant, Phi has to interact with all the standard model fermions. So now when I take my trace to define the color anomaly, I trace not just over my one new quark, but instead over all six quarks of the standard model. Up, down, um, strange charm, top, bottom. And so the color anomaly is six times bigger. I have six quarks charged in the Petri Quinn in the fundamental. So the color anomaly in the DFSD model is six. Um, in addition, I know that the leptons are charged from the Petri Quinn. So I have direct interactions between the axion and the electron. So it's not the hadronic axion. And then there are also, also other constraints um, because I've introduced an addition, um, three additional Higgs fields um, which are heavy. 
um, but you get constraints on these from the, and you get some constraints on, the, on these type of models from LHC searches for um, two Higgs doublet models. So, in lectures nine and ten, we're going to talk about all of these constraints. We have, um, we're going to talk about astrophysical constraints from Big Bang synthesis and the beam dump experiment from Super 97A. These exclude the particular minor blood check axia that kind of KV method. We're also going to set, um, look for uh, direct searches for the light um, KSVZ and BFSC axioms. So the KSVZ and BFSC axioms, what they allowed you to do was change the K constant of the axion to no longer be the Higgs web. When you change the K constant, the axion mass is inversely proportional to that. Here, so it makes the axion lighter. You can make F really, really big. That decouples everything because all of your coupling constants, remember when we wrote down our Feynman rules, all the coupling constants are like one over S. We can make F really big. We can decouple the axion and make it massless. And, we'll, and then we'll talk, most of the course will be about talking, talking about searches for these light axions in KSVZ and DFSC variants, where the masses are of order micro EV and lighter for the ultralight case, but for QCD axion, order micro EV. And we're going to talk about all of these types of searches and how we search for the QCD axion heliscopes, um, heliscopes, light shining through a wall, all of these. So uh, that's the end for today. And I'll see you again tomorrow at 10 15. Okay, so I um, hope that works for everyone um, at scale. Um, and I'll see you also tomorrow at 10 15.